and we may be able to go, may be able to go, to 172. Oh, you don't want to get into the diversion. No. Okay, so let's pick it up. I can understand. Yep, thank you. <laughs> oh, we're at 168. C. Very likely that'll bring us up to the great digression. Let's get a couple of readers. What do you think? Would like to play? Socrates and Theodorus. Such, Theodorus, is my contribution to the defense of your friend. The best I can make from my small means. Were he alive to speak for himself, it would be a much more impressive affair. Diagrams, 
or whether all men are as sufficient unto themselves as you are in astronomy and the other sciences in which you are allegedly to be superior. <coughs> it is not easy, Socrates, for anyone to sit beside you and not be forced to give an account of himself. And it was foolish of me just now to say you would excuse me and not and would not oblige me. As the last the Denoyans do to strip. You seem to me to take rather after Skyrim. For the Lacedaemonians tell people to go away or else strip. But you seem to me to play rather the role of Antius. For you do not let anyone go who approaches you until you have forced them to strip and wrestle you with, wrestle with you in argument. Oh, your comparison with Iran and Antius pictures my complaint admirably. Only that I am more a stubborn combatant than any. For many of her believe and many of Theseus, strong men of words, have fallen no. in with me and belabored me mightily. But still I do not desist. Such a terrible love of this kind of exercise has taken hold on me. So now that it is in your turn. So now that it is your turn, do not refuse to try a bout with me. Well, it will be good for both of us. I say no more. Lead on as you like. Most assuredly, I must endure whatsoever faith you spend with me. And submit to interrogation. However, I shall not be able to leave myself in your hands beyond the point you propose. Even that is enough. And please be especially careful that we do not inadvertently give a playful turn to our argument and somebody reproach us again for it. Mommy. Rest assured, I will try so far as I that in the lies. <clears throat> let us therefore first take up the same question as before and let us see whether we were right or wrong in being displeased <coughs> and finding fault with the doctrine because it made each individual self-sufficient in wisdom. Protagoras granted that some persons excelled others in respect to the better and the worse. And these, he said, were wise. Did he not? Yes. Now, if he himself were present and could agree to this, instead of our making the concession for him in our effort to help him, there would be no need of taking up the question again or of re reinforcing his argument. But as it is, Perhaps it might be said that we have no authority to make the agreement for him. Therefore, it is better to make the agreement still clearer on this particular point, for it makes a good deal of difference whether it is so or, or not. That is true. Let us then get the agreement in as concise a form as possible, not through the others, but from his own statement. <coughs> How? In this way. He says, does he not, that which that which appears to each person really is to him to whom it appears. Yes, that's what he says. Well then, <clears throat> Protagoras, we, we also utter the opinions of man, or rather of all men, and we say that there is no one who does not think himself wiser than others in some respects, and others wiser than himself in other respects. For instance, in times of great danger, when people are distressed in war, or by diseases, or at sea, they regard their commanders as gods and expect them to be their saviors, though they excel them in nothing except knowledge. And all the world of men is, I dare say, full of people seeking teachers and rulers for themselves, and the animals, and for hum themselves and the animals, and for human activity and on the other hand, of people who consider themselves qualified to teach and qualified to rule. And in all these instances, we must say that men themselves believe that wisdom and ignorance exist in the world of men. Must we not? Yes, we must. And therefore they think that wisdom is true thinking and ignorance is true thinking, and ignorance false opinion. False opinion. Do they not? <coughs> of course. Well then, Protagoras, what shall we do about the doctrine? Shall we say that the opinions which men have are always true? 
or sometimes true and sometimes false. For the result of either statement is that their opinions are not always true, but may be either true or false. Just think, Theodorus, would any follower of Protagoras, or you yourself, care to contend that no person thinks that another is ignorant and has false opinions? No, that is incredible, Socrates. And yet this is the predicament to which the doctrine that ma that man is the measure of all things inevitably leads. How so? When you have come to a decision in your own mind about something and declare your opinion to me, this opinion is, according to his doctrine, true to you. Let us grant that. But may not the rest of us sit in judgment on your decision, or do we always judge? that your opinion is true. Do not myriads of men on each occasion oppose their opinions to yours, believing that your judgment and belief are false. <coughs> I should just think so, Socrates, thousands and ten thousands, as Homer says, and they give me all the trouble in the world. Well then, Shall we say that in such a case your opinion is true to you but false to the myriads? The doctrine certainly seems to imply that. <coughs> and what of Protagoras himself? <coughs> If neither he himself thought, nor people in general think, as indeed they do not, that man is the measure of all things, is it not inevitable that the truth which he wrote is true to no one? Which he wrote is true to no one. But if he himself thought it was true, and people in general do not agree with him, in the first place you know that it is just so much more false than true as the number of those who do not believe it is greater than the number of those who do. That follows if it's truth or falsity varies with each individual opinion. Secondly, it involves this, which is a very pretty result. Which is a very pretty result. He concedes about his own opinion, the truth of the opinion of those who disagree with him, and thinks that his opinion is false since he grants that the opinions of all men are true. See, let me read that again. He concedes about his own opinion, the truth of the opinion of those who disagree with him, and think that his opinion is false, since he grants that the opinions of all men are true. Certainly. <coughs> then would he not be conceding that his own opinion is false, if he grants that the opinion of those who think he is in error is true? Necessarily. But the others do not concede that they are in error, do they? No, they do not. And he, in turn, according to his writings, grants that this opinion also is true. Protagoras will dispute, or rather, he will grant, after he once concedes that the opinion of the man who holds the opposite view is true. Even Protagoras himself, I say, will concede that neither a dog nor any casual man is a measure of anything whatsoever that he has not learned. Is not this the case? Yes. Okay. Then since the truth of Protagoras is disputed by all, it would be true to nobody, neither to anyone else, nor to him. I think, Socrates, we are running my friend too hard. <laughs> but, my dear man, I do not see that we are running beyond what is right. Most likely, though, he, being older, is wiser than we. And if, for example, he should emerge from the ground here at our feet, if only as far as the neck, he would prove abundantly that I was making a fool of myself by my talk 
in all probability, and you by agreeing with me, then he would sink down and be off at a run. But we, I suppose, must depend on ourselves, such as we are, and we must say what we think. And so now, must we not say that everybody would agree that some men are wiser and some more ignorant than others? Yes, I think we, at least, we must. And do you think his doctrine might stand most firmly in the form in which we sketched it when defending Protagoras, that most things, hot, dry, sweet, and everything of that sort, are to each person as they appear to him? And if Protagoras is to concede that there are cases in which one person excels another, he might be willing to say that in matters of health and disease, not every woman or child or beast, for that matter, knows what is wholesome for it and is able to cure itself. But in this point, if in any, one person excels another. And likewise, in affairs of state, the honorable and disgraceful, the unjust and just, the pious and its opposite, are in truth to each state such as it thinks they are. And as it enacts into law for itself, and in these matters no citizen and no state is wiser than another, but in making laws that are advantageous to the state or the reverse, Protagoras again will agree that one counselor is better than another, and the opinion of one state better than that of another as regards the truth. He would by no means dare to affirm that whatsoever laws a state makes in the belief that they will be advantageous to itself are perfectly sure to prove advantageous. But in the other class of things, I mean just and unjust, pious and impious, they are willing to say with confidence that no one of them possesses by nature an existence of its own. On the contrary, that the common opinion becomes true at the time when it is adopted and remains true as long as it is held. This is substantially the theory of those who do not altogether affirm the doctrine of Protagoras. But Theodorus, okay. our woman after... Okay. 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 <laughs> That's it. Right? And that's the first piece of what we would call strict philosophy. <laughs> huh. Let's see the, the structure of it. system. Let's call it the reconstruction. They first agree on that. Statement at 169D. Restatement of its main point. We'll call that 169D. Statement of its main points 
it affirms it, it affirms it by citing what we would call a source. He says, doesn't he, that what seems true to anyone is true for him to whom it seems so. He says, right? Source. Quote. Right, that's exactly at 170A. First thing he does, reviews the position in respect to common examples. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Sea captain war. Right. Right. Human activity. Right. One seventy A B. That establishes that wisdom and ignorance exist among men. Right? Establishes knowledge and ignorance. First conclusion. Right. Therefore, wisdom here is defined as thinking truly. And obviously, the opposite for the ignorance is false, a false opinion, a false belief. turns to the argument itself. Right? In that case, Protagoras, what do we make of your doctrine? Well, we've reconstructed it, got a restatement of its main points. He affirms it by citing a quote from Protagoras, who reviews the position with respect to common examples. Right? And therefore, he concludes from that that you can say that knowledge and ignorance exist among men. Right, therefore, he defines from all this, hey, you know what? We can now use the word wisdom, thinking truly, and define it. Ignorance is it? obviously a false belief or opinion. Okay, the, begin, the ball game begins now. In this case, in this case, arguing from this, what are we to make of the doctrine of Pythagoras? Are we to say that what men think is always true? Or that is sometimes true and sometimes false? Now here's this challenge. Right? Here's this whole challenge. This is what I like. This was I had to stop and think, right? Yeah. Because the first one I said, how's he get that? And then I got it. Are we to say that what men think is always true? Or is it sometimes true and sometimes false? From either supposition. It results that their thoughts are not always true, but both true and false. For consider, Theodorus, are you or is any Pythagorean prepared to maintain that no one regards anyone else as ignorant or as making false judgments? <laughs> yeah. Okay, look, look what he's done. If if Protagoras 
if Protagoras' position is true, he assumes it's true, then all he's now going to do is push implications. That's all he's going to do. He says, all right, come on, if that's true, are you prepared to say then that no man makes a mistake? If the document says that a man's opinion is always true, then therefore the implication of that is that not even someone who says that would say that all men's opinions are always true. Well, that's not the way I saw it. I saw the other guy. The first is on the other guy. No, I disagree. If you have an opinion and I disagree with you and we're both right, one of us has to be wrong. And therefore, then one of us has to have a false opinion. Yeah, well, that's true. So, okay, well, okay, well, that's, that's, okay, that's, that's, isn't that right? Isn't that what the implication of that is? Yeah. That if, if all opinions are true and we have different opinions about the same thing. Somebody's not going to agree that all the opinions are true, even if they're both protagonists. No, but, no, we have to go with this and assume that they're always true. Yeah. We have to take that and say, okay, if the opinions of all men are always true, then what comes from that is that some are false. Yeah. Yeah. Because if we disagree about the same thing, one of us is wrong. Okay. All right. Notice this first point. Would you read it in your text, please? No, no, no. 170C, just before D. Well, the result of either statement is that their opinions are always true, but may be either true or false. Keep going. <clears throat> just think, Theodore, would any follower of Protagoras, or you yourself, care to pretend that no person thinks that another is ignorant? That's enough. Yes. Just that first part. Hmm. Look here. All of these people are Protagoras. Huh? They all say what seems true to anyone is true to him to whom it seems so. They all agree and they nod their heads in total agreement, don't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the force of what Socrates is asking? Wait a minute. Do you people, are you willing to agree that no one regards anyone else as ignorant? Good. It's so, it, it's just, you haven't talked to me lately. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, 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 that's, a, that's a very interesting way of going. Isn't it? Like, what's, what's different? It's like, What's different about this style of reasoning? It's really remarkable. It's like uh, old. What? Straight to the. Yeah, it's, straight. Straight. it's like straight to the straight to the heart of human judgment. Like, you know, That's right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Like, like everybody goes along with us, and someone comes along and raises their hand and says, "Hey, do you mean to say that no one regards anyone else as ignorant? It's not personal." It's like it doesn't emperor. attack anybody. No, that's, right. that's like the emperor's new clothes, isn't it? Yeah, that's oh, like oh. the child. Says, hey, that guy hasn't got anything on. We had a Chinese girl in our class this last year. Jen. And she'd come up with these things. Oh, she'd say things like that? Yeah, you know. You know, you'd see one philosopher drop, and then she'd do it again the next week. Another one would drop. These little terse little stigma. Yeah. 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 Oh, she's still around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, look. Or, as making false judgments. Like, all of these people agree among themselves. Like, everybody does. Everyone has a right to their own opinion. Who's to say who's right or wrong? I mean, everything is a matter of opinion. Excuse me, uh, do you mean that no one regards anyone else as ignorant? Would you mind saying that again? Would <laughs> <laughs> you mind saying that? Well, did, did you or does anybody to know? Uh, with regard that there's no one else who's ignorant. I mean, no one else who's never met anyone. No, no. You've never said anything. <laughs> That is a point. Oh, crushing. It's <laughs> crushing. It's an obvious flaw. It's like truth and practice. Now, all he does, look here, all he does is take, take the consequences of those. That's all he's going to do. This is the game. I want to see something. Just watch. That's incredible, Socrates. It sure is. <laughs> you know, that sure is. That is incredible. <laughs> now, 
Are you willing to say that no one regards anyone else as ignorant? It's perfectly simple to say. It's not attacking anybody. It's a wonder, isn't it? It's like saying, excuse me. <laughs> Would you read? That principle can go so far for people. Well, you know, that is the inevitable consequence of the doctrine that makes man the measure of all things. I love this. He makes the statement, and the protagonist has to ask him what he means, so he's just telling him what he means. <laughs> Look here, there's, a, there's, a, there's an exploration right. going on. Right. And someone would like to hold the position and defend this position. It's his teacher. Theodore is his teacher for diary. Right. Well, notice what he does at that moment. He gets the other guy to say, well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. He's given up the defense. Mm -hmm. That, however, is the inevitable, inevitable consequence of the doctrine which makes man the measure of all things. How so? Oh, you want me to explain? Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> He's an angler. When you have formed a judgment on some matter in your own mind and express an opinion about it to me, let us grant that, as Pythagoras' theory says. It's true for you. Let's grant it. Let's grant his theory. Notice. What he's going to do is accept it as true and just drive home the implications. That's all he's going to do. He's not going to argue against it. He's going to say, look here, state the theory. State the theory. Don't disagree with it. Don't waste your time disagreeing with it. Assume it's true. And if there are any weaknesses in it, let the weaknesses become apparent. And that's all philosophy is. That's Okay, let's agree that Pythagoras' theory. Let us grant that as Pythagoras' uh, says. It's true for you. By the way, are we to understand that it's impossible for us, the rest of the company, to pronounce any judgment upon your judgment? Look here. When you, we'll make him the you, right? No. Say, when you agree with Pythagoras' theory, does that mean that we can't judge your judgment? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can understand how you would agree with it. After all, you happen to be his student. But does that mean we can't judge your judgment, Theodorus? What, do you, what, what happens to his theory at this point? He has to say, of course, you people can make a judgment. All right, you have to. Uh, or if we can, uh, is it that we must always and inevitably pronounce your opinion and your judgment upon this and all other matters as inevitably and always true? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, will it follow that we will always regard your judgment as true? Always? Inevitably? Well, what do you think? <clears throat> person is right. Mine will never say yes. Can. He's saying that he's infallible. He does. Yeah, we can understand why you would accept that theory. After all, we've been influenced by many people. By the way, do we have to agree with your judgment? And when we do, do we always accept that what you, you judge is true? <laughs> no. Well, especially since what's true to you is true to you. Do you not rather find thousands of opponents who set their opinion against yours on every occasion and hold that, their, that your judgment and belief are false. I mean, don't you find, right? don't you find that many people inevitably disagree with one person thinks? Well, good heavens, how did you ever come to this agreement? Well, what's the consequence? What are you going to say? Would you, 
Would you have us say that in such a case the opinion you hold is true for yourself and false for all of these others? Oh, whoa. Look, he doesn't disagree with the guy. He says, look, let's accept what you're saying. That's the key to everything this man does. He never disagrees. What we call disagreement. He never argues. Assumes it's true and and, and it has demonstrates the consequences that would necessarily fall. Yeah. And in a way, it's perfectly obvious if you get some kind of a psychic distance from the point. Right? It's really, it's really using the mind as you might view a scenery and point out objects. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you can't be personally involved. Can't be personally involved. That's the problem. Hmm. You, can't, you can't be personally involved in trying to convince him. Mm -hmm. You can't be personally involved in either accepting or rejecting it. It's a distance, you know, you have a distance and say, no, it's true. What follows if you accept it? So it's very interesting. Right, yeah. The doctrine seems to imply that. This is one way along. If this is what we're saying, if we're saying it's about you. All right. What are the consequences for him? Now let's go back to him. We've just been talking about you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What is the consequence for Pythagoras himself? <laughs> He's wondering. Is it not this? Supposing that not even he believed in man being the measure, and the world in general did not believe it either, as in fact it doesn't, you know. Then this truth which he wrote would not be true for anyone. If on the other hand, he did believe it, but the mass of mankind does not agree with him, then you see is more false than true by just so much as the unbelievers outnumber the believers. <coughs> By his own measurement. By his own measurement. Oh, something like natural reason, like the most natural form of reason. Seems to see it. See, it's not the reason. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, you know, the tiger has believed it, mankind not, then it's more false than true. If the tigers didn't believe it, neither he nor has anyone else believed it. That follows if its truth and falsity varies with each individual. Now, in this next two paragraphs is, is really a magnificent condensed argument. I mean, it's really exquisite. Yes, and besides that, it involves a really exquisite conclusion. Pythagoras, for his part, admitting as he does that everyone's opinion is true, it is inevitable, is it not, that he must acknowledge the truth of his opponent's belief about his own belief where they think he's wrong. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Certainly. That is to say, he would acknowledge his own belief to be false if he admits that belief of those who think him wrong is true. But the others on their side do not admit themselves that they're wrong. No, whereas Pythagoras once more, according to what he has written, admits that his opinion, that this opinion of theirs is as true as any other. And on all hands, Pythagoras must join us in the general consent when he admits to uh, an opponent the truth of his contrary opinion. Are you saying this this philosophical position, as you now express it and understand it, is so obviously false on the face of it that you can't conceive of anyone using this in society? Have you read Dale Carnegie? No, I haven't. How to Win Friends and Influence People? Very much like this. Okay, look. Let's go through some, right? Let's call this is Pythagoras' position. Therefore, we can call it P, can we not? Huh? Now, would Pythagoras, would Pythagoras admit that this is a judgment, Paul? Um. Would he, admit, would he admit that not only is it a judgment, it's a judgment which it seems due to be true must be true? Must be. Huh? Uh, does he admit that other people can judge this theory or not? Yes. 
then others, and judge it. Right. Huh? Right. Do you conclude that when people judge things, they judge it either to be true and accepted, mm -hmm. or false and rejected? Yes. Right. Because, because that is the way in which we make judgments. Right. 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 Well then, is this, this is a theory, is it not? This is a judgment. This is a judgment. This is, let's call it a, uh, this is a judgment in a class of theories, are they not? Mm -hmm. This is a theory, philosophical theory, well, position, philosophical statement, we can call it. Right, well then, philosophical theory, then obviously other people can judge this or not? Yes. Necessarily? Necessarily. Oh. Then they either can accept it or reject it. True. What follows? What follows when they reject it? What follows? What are the consequences? Of it's false. To, to, to them, it's false. Uh, what happens to, to Pythagoras' theory? All right, look here. Let's try it. Then, then you agree in principle they can judge it to be false. Yes. All right. Now, can, can Pythagoras judge their judgment or not? Yes. Can Pythagoras judge their judgment? Yes. Therefore, he either can consider their judgment true or false. Is that right? Right. What follows when he says that their judgment is true? <coughs> uh, I think that he is that he is false. All right. If if he agrees, own argument. Right? If he agrees, he's wrong. That is wrong. So therefore, he can't agree. What follows then if he rejects it? What is he saying about their ability to make a judgment? Um. So your, your judgment is false. You know, they, then they, they can't make a judgment, or they can't make a true judgment. Well, what happens to his theory? It falls apart. Right. So therefore, you see, whether whether he agrees or disagrees, when they make a judgment about his system, thinking it false, and we've already agreed that a number of people can do that. Right. He's already got that, doesn't he? Right. From the previous statement. That the position that falls on. Internally, by itself. Right. 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 <laughs> this is the Perry Tropa. This is the turning the tables argument. This is what the guy did to him in court, right? Wasn't yeah. it? Someone? Mm -hmm. When he. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, remember, wait. remember the student that wouldn't pay? Oh. No. How did that one go? Well, I thought it was someone. If he thinks that my fee is too large. Then all he has to do is go to the temple and declare under oath what value he thinks, and therefore accordingly pay it. Mm -hmm. But he he went to court though, right? The temple. Oh, the temple. Yeah, the temple. And so, what did the guy say? Well, if the guy goes to the temple and says that he charged too much, mm -hmm. then he's not getting much. Is that your machine? I always like to tell her about that machine. For so long, I thought it was her telephone. So did I. Of course, she gets a lot of calls. Popular person, right? All right, let me go back to 171b. That is to say, he would acknowledge his own belief to be false if he admits the belief of those who think him wrong is true. Right. That's just what I did here in six steps. Right. Necessarily. But the others on their side, they don't admit that they're wrong. They think they're right. Whereas Protagoras, once more, according to what he has written, admits that his opinion of theirs, that this opinion of theirs is as true as any other. He has to agree that their opinion is true as any other. Doesn't. So he, he can't do this. He has to agree with this. And all he's doing is saying, hey, what follows when he has to agree 
when they judge his judgment to be false. He has to agree with it. What follows? Is he doesn't do anything at all. It's an internal contradiction. Bill Deeds become manifest, and you just said, "Here, you still want it?" Yeah. But if that was that easy, why do so many people accept it? That's a good question. This is probably the cause of more students in America becoming anti-intellectual. In you know, whole department. Matter of fact, I have an excellent tape. Do I have an excellent tape? I did this. I took this once. If I can never find it, somebody's interested. There was a big battle going on in the college. What constitutes teaching? <laughs> there was a big issue, and they were out to get people. And I don't know. <laughs> so <laughs> Sheila Brazier came up to me and said, "Here, uh, we're going to have this this uh, program where different instructors going to come up and give a typical kind of, of lecture that he gives and give it to the faculty." And I said, "Well, I'm all for it, Sheila, so long as everybody's included." Oh, she said, "Oh, yeah, sir." So, so the per one person they wanted to get even more than me was Tate. Mm -hmm. Tate. What's this person? Tim, Tim. Tim, 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 Tim Tate. Tim. Well, he really did terrible. He, he, really, he was really a mess. In fact, wasn't it over his evaluations? They were trying to bump him. Yeah, they were trying to get rid of him. They were trying to force him out. Yeah. He was teaching anthropology, I think. Human sexuality. Human sexuality. Plumbing. Right. Taught it as a plumber. Yeah, I taught it as a plumber. So many strokes per second. Uh, so my turn came, and I said, "Okay, I'll go next." And I took this position, which I knew 90% of my faculty members accept. And I have this tape of the meeting. Oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> that would be great. I mean, let, let me tell you several things that happened. One is, there were no further speakers. <laughs> it ended. <laughs> it ended. <laughs> it ended in a fury. <laughs> These people couldn't do anything. I just, I just took it I took it from the audience. I took it from them. I didn't do it from the I just took it out and demonstrated. I said, look at this position. I developed the position the Pythagoras put on the board. And then stayed back and said, by the way, would you like to? And I took Peggy Staggs. Fuck you, Peggy. Bob Angus. Bob Angus. Oh, Angus. <laughs> 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 and when it came down here. <laughs> and they swallowed the hook. <laughs> they went all the way. <laughs> there were copies of that tape that were sent all over the world. Wow. Nice, sweetie. Really. Sure. And, uh. Here. Oh, it's true to you. It's true to you. We both can exist with different things. Go away. The same thing. Oh, here. How you right? judging How does it go away? Yeah. How did you do that? My God. You got it. <laughs> Are you telling stories about that? Oh, it I just sounded wanted to make like sure. it. No. <laughs> it sounded good, Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> well, wasn't it over the issue of how can we judge another fellow faculty member in the conference? Yes. That's right. As a matter of fact, it got worse because later he and I talked and I said, you know, what you demonstrated up there is a problem. He said, really? I said, yeah. So I took him through it and he saw what he was doing, got some great insights into himself, and, and followed it up with a letter. God, I wonder if I still have that letter. It's a great document because then he wrote and explained to the faculty 
on the basis of our discussion, why he took that position and no longer holds the position. Then these people came at him and said, look, see, he's a liar. Who was it that took the position? Tim Tate. He took this position. No. He had his own position. Oh, his own position. The way he would conduct it himself and the content was so bad, I said, look, we need to talk. He saw the roots of his problem. And then in response to that, he wrote a letter to the faculty explaining explaining that and pointing out that the former position he had no longer holds. They took that as an example of the line and pressure to get him out. As a matter of fact, they were successful. You mean because he tried to change his mind? Yeah. yeah well, they couldn't yeah. believe that anybody could have a discussion with somebody and see into their problem and resolve it and then be willing to go before a group and say, look, I made a mistake before. They said that whole thing was a pretext and fun. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he lied. He, he lied without uh, saying that. What was he saying then? Well, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. Well, they thought he was trying to get out of his yeah. poor performance yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it got very heavy. Very heavy. It was delightful. Went on for a year. Oh yeah. I have the tape. I'll find it. But maybe I can find that tape. Someone made a transcript of it. I think, too. Did anyone want to? Bill Irwin. Bill Irwin made a tape of it. Transcript of it. Okay. He's not finished now. Right? He goes beyond what he's already done. I mean, anybody can leave it at this point. I mean, he does something that seems to me to be so magnanimous that it really captures the nature of Socrates. Let's try. Right? At 171. B. And further, shall we say that the doctrine would find its firmest footing in the position we trace down in our defense of Protagoras? That most things, hot, dry, sweet, everything of that sort, are to each person as they appear to him, are they not? In other words, this position is true. It is true. This position is true. On the level of sensation. Yeah, for a certain class of things. On the level of sensations. Of course, the way you the way you experience sensations are for you the way you perceive them. There's no doubt about it. See what he does? Mm -hmm. Now, look here. He's going to do it. He's going to do it on three other bases. <coughs> right? Look, look at the way he perceives. That most thing. <coughs> Hot, dry, sweet, everything of that sort are to each person as they appear to him, are they not? Whereas if there is any case in which the theory would concede that one man is superior to others, to another, it might consent to admit that in the matter of good or bad, health, not any woman or child or animal, for that matter, knows what is wholesome for it and is capable of curing itself. Yeah, obviously. There's a certain area where no one is going to concede that this is true. This is true in sensation. In one place, no one will agree that it's true. In matters of health, good and bad health. Everybody's opinion, who cares about it? You just want one man's opinion. A man who has knowledge, a man is called a physician. Right now he's going to save it. Second place he says it. In social matters, mm -hmm. the theory will say that so far as good and bad customs, or rights and wrongs, or matters of religion are concerned, whatever any state makes up its mind to enact as lawful for itself really is lawful for it. You can't deny that. In matters of social matters, of customs, and of matters of religion, whatever people enact or whatever they come to agree to, are in fact lawful, lawful to them, this is really so far as they come together to agree and consent to it. This is really quite different than that translation. Well, I'm adding a few words. But that's the end. And in this field, no individual or state is wiser than another. It's here on these three issues. 
social matters, conventions, what we would say customs, right and wrong, good and bad, religion, these areas. Whatever any group thinks is good for them is good to them, as long as they think it. And in this field, no individual or state is wiser than another. But I'll tell you one area where it is different, and this is critical. But when there's a question of laying down what is to its advantage or disadvantage, mm. here is where the theory will admit a difference between any two advisors, or between the decisions of two different states, mm. or who would hard you know who, who would venture to assert that any enactment which a state supposes to be for its advantage will be to its advantage simply because it enacts it. Yeah, see? See, obviously, in these three areas, especially in matters of the state, anything the state thinks is lawful for it is lawful for it. But it's another thing to think it's to their advantage when they enact laws that, it, in fact, it is to their advantage. And take any two advisors in the state. Do they agree entirely about everything? In respect to what? The advantage and future possibilities and the consequences of certain laws that they enact. Who's to say? In those cases, what's the advantage of the state? <coughs> but in the matter I'm speaking of, in the right and wrong and in matters of religion, people are ready to affirm that none of these things is natural with a reality of its own but rather that the public decision becomes true at the moment when it's made and remains true so long as the decision stands. And those who do not argue altogether as Pythagoras carry on their philosophy along such lines as these, don't they? Uh, that was uh, what was the gentleman there? The digression, the digression. Right, okay. that's right. See, they're not quite Pythagoreans, right? Those people. Now, let me, let me give you guys an assignment, all right? Here's the assignment. You have to know this section. You simply have to know it. On a conversational level. You simply have to know this in conversational level. To be able to take someone through it in a dialogue. You simply have to do it. And if you don't, you're at a great disadvantage. What do, you, what, do you, what do you say? When you say you have to do it on a conversation, like you have to be able to you have, to have practice it so well so you can do it naturally. That's right. That's right. That's right. This is easy. Yeah, not pull out the book or your notes. No, no. Have to. Step by step. And try it out as often as you can, as nicely as you can. And that's why this quote is so important. This style of thinking is so different from our everyday thought. That style of reasoning. Didn't you just say that no, 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 no one at all regards anyone else as ignorant? Or did we you say that no one regards anyone else as ever making a false judgment about anything? And if you do that, you know what you have? You have the first step in it. But notice. Had you done this, built it up, first knock it down with all those rhetorical tricks, and then rebuild it, and then able to restate its main point, mm -hmm. right, that's, 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 that's going to be answered. But this part you have to know. But this is hidden down here, what isn't it, in our, in our structure, isn't it? I mean, it's not, in our society, it's not as blatantly put forth as Protagoras puts it. Well, I'd be surprised because, uh, you know, I do it every year at college, and uh, it's, I always find it amazing to see the impact it has. I hear it a lot, though. Of course. You know, like, well, you know, it's okay for me to believe what I want to believe for. Especially about psychology, it seems, you know, that, like the psychology of people will say, well, you know, I think this is true for me, it may not be for you. Well, kids, you know, kids argue with their parents uh, develop that just spontaneously. Things are, you know, you, you think what you think, and I'll think what I think, and, you know, and they don't know, they haven't got the sophistication to argue with the parents, you know, but they still always say that. That's what's No, I think that's the reason they do. In a way, <laughs> it's just, it's like that's what the other family thinks, is what we think is true. Yeah, well, see, that's the way both can live, without discovering what is really true. 
That's how you, you don't have to do that. You say, oh, I'm right and you're right. We don't have to look for the truth. And, you know, it's not the, the community to argue that. Yeah. So, you know. yeah. and, and I hope we don't lose the, the there's a certain element, which is uh, today's uh, review the position with respect to common examples. Yeah, yeah right. <coughs> You know, like when he says aboard ship during a storm. Yeah. <coughs> Would you say that any man has the right to get up and direct the destiny of the crew and the passengers simply because he thinks that uh, his opinion about what way to navigate the ship is proper simply because he thinks so? Or would you not ask him if the captain were ill and no longer able to command the ship and direct it? Then anyone is equally as good simply because they think so <laughs> to direct the ship. Or would you say, no, no, no one's going to direct it if I can't? Ask them a few questions about their experience and their knowledge. <laughs> On board a plane. All right? Do you think any drunk has the right to walk up there, get into the pilot's car, oh, and say, I can fly this fucking plane, and I can do it anytime, any place, anywhere? And the captain says, well, excuse me, of course you can. Where is Everyone the has the right to act out their opinions, don't they? That's right. Oh, this is you know, this is a common, common example. Shake it. See, they shake it. They prepare, don't they? They shake it. And that establishes this point. Right? That the, therefore it follows then that wisdom and, ex and ignorance does exist among them. Yeah. Right? It establishes that then you can begin this. Very fine. Yeah. Very fine. Very, very good. This is one of the high points. Now this is just Pythagoras. Now he goes on a digression. And then he comes back to Heraclitus and he takes on the next one. Yeah. Real fun. But he still, this by the way, he still doesn't reject, there's still a better rejection of this position. That's right. That's yet to come. Oh, that's right. See, this is just rejecting his formal position. It's a formal position, see? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There's one. And now he's going to go back to the position behind it, or the foundation position, which knowledge is perception. Right. So, the Tiger's position depends upon knowledge of perception as its model. So he's going to take that later, and he's really going to undercut it. Exquisite, really exquisite. So really it's the issue just really got to the, uh, the, uh, the foundation without reading it. Like at, at the college, you know, very often you can put this position on you know, knowledge is perception. And if people talk about it, then you point out the word. You know, by the way, perception, where does that take place? Mm -hmm. Does that take place between the eyeball and the object? I mean, is there a difference between the perceiver, perceiving, and the perceived? Yeah. Well, where is the perceiving? Is that perception, T I O N, act of? Uh huh. No, hey, okay, would you please perceive this? Yes. If knowledge is perception, that would be taking place between you and it, wouldn't it? Okay. Well, how much knowledge do you get out of that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, just there, there are all kinds of examples. You can just kind of shake up the position. And it always shakes people up, you know. I mean, I was once in a philosophy class teaching at night. And the next time I came back, 30% were gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, they think this is sophistry. They think it's sophistry when you attack this position. Yeah, they think it's logic, logical trickery. Because it proves them wrong. Because it proves them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Remarkable piece of this. But this is real fun. We have to give them something, and we have to. What we have to correct this position because obviously, what the, if you think this is true, obviously it's false just on the face of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is. Let me point out to you, and you build it up a bit, and man, get it all mad. But you said that, that one, there might be no knowledge being in the possession of something, you said that, that he does that in, in a certain way. Did you say that? that one, What's that? I, I, that, that one, that one uh, argument you were just talking about, uh, about it, pointing out there's no knowledge and perception between the perceiver and how we perceive it, so how much knowledge is that? In, 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 in a way, that 
It's in the beginning. It's in the when he's talking about light and that perception, right? Maybe I heard you wrong. If you're asking me whether or not what I just did is in the dialogue, yeah. no, it's not. Okay. I think it's in the form of it. Yes, there is a form of it. Yeah. There's a form of it, and that's what we're going to later. What time is it? I was talking about emanation. Quick. Nine twenty-six. Good. That's right. And the digression. What would it take, Paul, to put this in your head tonight? Tonight? Yeah. I mean, you know what we did tonight. Tonight. What we did tonight, tonight? not to put it in your head oh, tonight. Oh, okay. What would it take you and make me a lot? Yeah, it'd make me a lot. Uh, smarter. How would it make you feel among people? Much better. How would it make you feel among people? Sir? You've done it. What, how does it, what, is, what does it do? Yeah. Yeah, this is very simple to do. This is what I call the cheap way to get a reputation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a cheap way to get it. It's better than getting a tweed suit on the East Coast. Yeah. Or in the 50s, I hate to go back that far, having a beard. In 1950, I had a beard. And uh, I got my uh, tweed suit. It's real fun. It was my only tweed suit on. And I walked into bookstores that formerly I went into, and you know, they didn't particularly take any interest in my appearance being there or not. You know, I was part of the woodwork. But with a tweed suit, glasses, and a beard, and a pipe in my mouth as I walked in, I was recommending books to the book <laughs> on the shelf. And I had only been in college for a year after being bounced out of high school six times, you know. <laughs> you had a good bet. <laughs> Man is the measure of all things. Yeah. Well, I need a cup. I need a cup. I'm the man. <laughs> so look here. This would really be a nice midwifery assignment to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All right? Do it. Do it. Okay. All right? And if you have trouble doing it, let's go through it and take that as the issue. Yeah. And ideally, try to do it as ideally. You know, imagine. Yeah. I can't do it Where'd she go? Where'd she go? There she is. There she is. She's a little bit tired now. Yep, it's close to zero. I guess she's been going with the investors. I mean, she is a busy person. This, oh, yes, I can vouch for that. Especially in the house.